morning. Visitors, uh, guests, those people online in the name of Jesus Christ, welcome. We're glad that you joined us for worship today. Uh, one worship word I found out this morning is Bruce Hudson, our accompanist, has unexpectedly uh, come down ill. Our thanks to Patty Ernst, our new director of music, who gladly offered to help. Thank you, Patty, for being here and your grace and uh, your presence here today. Thank you. Our worship begins with a confession and forgiveness. You are able to sing. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you call us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us, that we may bathe in the glory of your Son born among us, and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. Rejoice in this good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ, and inheritors of eternal life. Live as freed and forgiven children of God. Amen. Christ is proclaimed and raised from the dead, how can 
can be saved. It's not that there is no resurrection of the dead. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify of God that he raised Christ. The things he did not raise, it is true, and the dead are not raised. Or, if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in sins. Then, those also who have died in Christ have perished. If, for this life, only we have hoped in Christ, we are all of people but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. The word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. came down with them and stood on a level place for the great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all of the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, o Christ. Mary read it, you heard it. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. It's a famous story, maybe you have heard it, but I'm going to tell it again. Peter Marshall, then pastor of New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., Later, he would become chaplain of the U.S. Senate. Was scheduled to address the midshipmen at Annapolis. It was December 1941. He arrived just after the news about Pearl Harbor. What to say? He tossed out his prepared sermon. He decided that he wasn't there to get them all worked up or to witness to the righteous anger of God he knew that these young men had many things on their minds. The fear of the unknown, the prospect of death. He knew that what they needed from him was a plain reading of the Bible. Nothing less would do. And so he told the story of a family in his parish who in their own way had to face the same thing as these young sailors. Fear the unknown and the prospect of death. They had a little boy who had a fatal disease. Helpless, they watched him slip away. They were devastated. In spite of their best efforts to protect their son from knowing, he knew. Children know. Mommy, he said, what will happen to me? Reaching down deep to something inside she did not know she had, the mother said to her son, you know what it is like when you play hard all day and when you come into the house so tired that you fall asleep on the couch. The next thing that you know is 
that you wake up in the morning in your own room, in your own bed, safe and sound, because mommy and daddy put you there. You're tired. You're going to fall asleep. Before you know it, you will wake up in your own room, in your own bed, safe and sound, because Jesus put you there. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am there you may be also. This mother loved her son and she gave him one last great gift. The promise of Jesus. In January, back in 2002, Roy Harrisville, Emeritus Professor of New Testament at Luther Seminary, went to Princeton Seminary to see Don Jewell, now Professor of New Testament there. Both had been professors of mine. Don was the son of Roy's cousin. Don had been Roy's student. Roy had preached at Don's ordination. These two men went way, way back. And between them, they knew mountains of biblical scholarship and theology and theories that there are professors and scholars who sneer at the primitive idea of the resurrection. It was no surprise to them. They knew all about it. But on that day, Don Jewell was dying of a cruel disease that paralyzed his young lungs and robbed him of breath. It was time for a clear hearing of the promises of Jesus. No more word games. No more intellectual hide and seek. The promise of the resurrection, said Roy, sitting at Don's bedside, is given in two ways. That we will be with Christ on the day we die, as Jesus promised the thief on the cross. And that we will be raised on the last day, as St. Paul tells us. Which do you prefer? Which one do you hope for? Don said, I hope to be with Christ on the day that I die. When he said that, he had just two weeks to live. Christians are an odd people who have been around for over 2,000 years who claim that God raised Jesus from the dead. Someone said to me once, we can't say the resurrection happened, they said, because that would make Christianity different from all other faiths. And they were right. In Jesus' death, the enemy that tears us apart from our loved ones and tears up the world is defeated. This makes Jesus the Messiah, the King of all kings, through whom there is forgiveness and promise of eternal life. Christ is our brother who leads us to the place where we are not abandoned, we are not forgotten, not wrapped in darkness. But there will be light, peace, love in the presence of God, grace. The resurrection is grace. Writing just years after the resurrection of Jesus, Paul is like a person who has had cataracts removed. This is what Paul sees clearly early in the 15th chapter. For I handed to you as of first importance what I in turn received, that Christ died and was buried and was raised. That he appeared to the 12 disciples and to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time. And last of all, he appeared to me. Why is Paul writing? We heard it. It appears that some Corinthian Christians were doubting the resurrection. But instead of being pastoral and sympathetic, Paul takes the gloves off. Paul calls them out on it. For him, the resurrection is not an intellectual abstraction. It is not a metaphor or symbol. It is not a vague feeling. It is none of those things. No. Beyond our human logic and reason, God raised Jesus from the dead. A 
supernatural mirror of time and space. And so St. Paul is right to throw down the gauntlet. For him, there is no wiggle room. If the resurrection is not true, he says, then what's the point of it all? The resurrection of Christ is of not second, not third or fourth, but of first importance. The most importance. That's the big picture. Paul wants to remind the Corinthians, he wants to remind you and me of that big picture. And of course, there are times when the last thing we want to be reminded of is what is most important. And we all know this. Uh, when you're in a meeting, uh, you're in a discussion group, and the conversation gets dicey, there's sometimes someone who will say, let's stop for a moment, let's, let's look at the big picture. And then the big picture sort of serves as a distraction from the problems for which we have no solution. You want to say, you know, I have an idea, why don't we solve a problem first, any problem, and save that big picture for later. And we're kind of like that. We want to solve problems. How do we solve all the problems all around us? Gun violence and racism and policing. How do we solve all the problems within us? Struggling with family members, illness. And, and these questions overwhelm us. If Paul were to join the meeting, I believe he would say something like this. These are important problems, and they must be dealt with. But I'm wondering why you always begin at the wrong end of every issue. Have you ever thought of starting with what's more important than what are the problems? Mind you, the Corinthian church did have problems. Paul is dealing with a congregation that's divided in every way possible. For those of you who have read 1 Corinthians, you know what, that Paul's words have a really messy, messy context. 1 Corinthians reads like a soap opera. There are, uh, there are divisions over an attractive pastor in chapter 1. There are lawsuits between members of the church in chapter 6. And more, there's divorce, idolatry, false doctrine, drunkenness at Holy Communion in chapter 11. Otherwise, it's a perfect church. <laughs> And in the face of conflicts and struggles that would just grind down any normal human being, Paul says, let's start with what is of first importance. The resurrection. Jesus, why? This truth is where we find our vision. This truth is where we find our strength for living. This truth is the reason for our being. And that's where Paul says we need to begin to, with the resurrection of Christ. We can trust the truth of the resurrection, Paul says. And so faith, faith is a willingness, I think, to risk our lives in the conviction that while we human beings kill God's love for us and God's world, we can never, never, Keep God's love dead and buried. Jesus Christ is risen today, tomorrow, and every day. Diane Butler Bass spoke once of attending Trinity Episcopal Church in Santa Barbara, California. It was there that she met Daniel Corrigan. And Bishop Corrigan, Diana says, was one of those mid-20th century liberal princes of the pulpit. Bishop Corrigan was known for his support of the ordination of women and many causes for social justice. And after worship, someone came up to him and asked Bishop Corrigan, now, do you really believe in the resurrection? And Diana said that she was really waiting for his answer, for she says there is no way that Bishop Corrigan believed in a literal resurrection. Yet, 
is supported and replied to this parishioner without a cause. Yes, I believe in the resurrection. I have seen it too many times not to. And this worshiper's question of Bishop Corrigan and his response makes me wonder whether we have a harder time believing in Christ's resurrection or our own. And even if we do believe in our resurrection, most often we associate that with what happens after we die. But I believe that if that's all it is for us, we truly miss something. Because the truth is, resurrection is much more about the present as it is, as much about the present as it is for the future. And maybe that's our struggle. I mean, I don't have to tell you. Like you, I've heard and read it all week. COVID deaths over 900,000 in this country alone. A 15-year-old teenager shot. Friends suffering from depression. You don't have to look far. Deep grief and loss is all around us as we huddle in our caves. What hope is there for the resurrection? And I don't mean someday. I mean today. And while I don't want to, nor can I minimize any of that, I wonder if simply naming it, lamenting over it, crying out to God in honesty and pain, I wonder if that just might help us to trust that God, the God who raised Jesus from the dead, can take all of our death and give birth and new life in us and among us. I love how Ron Lucky puts it. He says the resurrection is about more than a fortunate Jewish rabbi being raised from the dead. It's about the whole world being raised from the dead when he was raised. It gives us the hope that the way things have always been will not always be because Jesus is alive. Resurrection is about today, too. Because Christ has risen, so can we. Whenever we begin to lose hope, wherever we have been given into despair, whenever we are convinced we cannot go on, whenever we feel as if there is no more living, the light and the love of the resurrected Christ reminds us of the hope of new life. Not tomorrow, today. And I know this is true. I don't remember what wretched thing I had done. I do know that it bothered me. I knew that I needed to go and face this person and apologize. And so when I saw my friend again, I was expecting the worst. In fact, I dreaded it. Would they, uh, would they welcome me? I knocked on the door, I came in, and at that point my eyes filled with tears. I thought I was going to get chewed out, but this person said the words I needed to hear. Mark. you know what I'm talking about. It was just one of the many ways that Christ, the resurrected Christ, brings us new life. Christ is risen. It's of first importance. By the help of God, we trust that it's true, real, so real that it says the same thing same thing to a professor of New Testament that it says to a little boy, to a whole church of Corinthians, to a bishop, to me, and to you. Today, tomorrow, every day, Christ is risen. Thanks be to God.
gracious God, in a world that is cautious about believing anything it cannot touch and measure, help us, O oh God, to be people of trust in you. Open our eyes, open our hearts. Help us to trust that you raised Jesus from the dead and that he lives. And the deadly things that threaten us in your world will not have the last word. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Bless with your comfort and healing all those who suffer, especially Pat and Pam and Gary, Anne and Joel and Rayanne, Howard, Jack, Amanda, Bruce and Michelle, and all those whom we name in our hearts before you. Grant them comfort, grant them relief, grant them hope. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Be present with all those who mourn this day, especially our sister Patty and her family as they mourn the death of her mother-in-law, Bernice. Brian and Pam as they mourn the deaths of Charlene and Tim. Comfort all who grieve in their pain and loss that in these days of sorrow, the power of Christ's resurrection might raise them to new life and to new hope. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all those who govern everywhere, that all may seek the end to violence and pursue the ways of peace. We pray that we may have wisdom to discern and speak truth and the courage to stand for the good of all people. Lord, in your mercy. And grant us grace to trust and believe in the resurrection of your Son. To trust as we go about our days that your love for us and for the world you so love can never ever be kept dead and buried. Lord, in your mercy, we lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. We continue with the offering.
guide us on our journey. Lead us to your table, nourish us with this heavenly food, and prepare us to carry your love to a hungry world. In the name of Christ, our light. Amen. We continue with Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Ushers will dismiss you forward. All are welcome at the Lord's table. <laughs>
holy body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you. Amen. We give you thanks, gracious God, for we have feasted on the abundance of your house. Send us to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all, strengthened with the richness of your grace. In your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning again. It's good to be back. Um, just a couple reminders. A reminder in the adult education hour beginning at 1045, we'll begin to look at the most recent social statement of our church that deals with faith, sexism, and justice. Um, this social statement is the culmination of seven year process across the whole church, and it's really intended to help us hear God's promise for life for all God's people. And we'll have discussion, we'll have some videos, we'll explore fairness for women and girls. Uh, come and join us for this important discussion. Uh, another reminder, Lent is fast approaching and we will again uh, publish the popular Congregational Lent and Devotional Booklet. We're looking for contributions and I'm inviting any and all of you to participate by writing a brief devotion in response to a short Bible text. There is a table right out in the narthex. I hope you'll take a moment to check out your options, uh, my suggestions for writing, and sign up for a day. There is a reading with your name on it. Again, it is good to see you all. Please stand. Now may God, who leads you in pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you and who calls you by name, bless your going out and your coming in, today and forever. Amen. Amen.
Christ into a weary world, share the good news. Thanks be to God.